All right, we'll go ahead and get started now as I see folks are still joining, um, but we'll give them a little buffer. So uh, I want to say thanks to everyone who's joining for taking the time uh, to have this conversation about responding to transnational repression. My name is Isabel Linzer and I'm a research analyst at Freedom House. I am delighted to be joined today by Yana Gorokowska, Senior Research Analyst at Freedom House, Sienna Ansis, a Senior Legal Advisor at Citizen Lab, Nora al jazawi a Research Officer at Citizen Lab, and Marcus Michelson, Senior post Postdoctoral Researcher at Rye University, Brussels. So thanks everyone in the audience and also on the panel. Um, we're gonna have a great conversation today. I'll start just a quick run of show. I'll give a few introductory remarks to set the stage before we get into the conversation. We will do our very best to leave a lot of time for audience Q&A at the end. Um, so as we go along, if you have questions, please submit them at any time through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. So to get right into it, we are here today to talk about transnational repression, which is when governments target their exiles and diasporas abroad. This covers a huge spectrum of tactics ranging from assassinations, kidnappings, and unlawful deportations to spyware, digital harassment, passport cancellations, threats, intimate imprisoning family members, and much more. At the beginning of the year, Freedom House released a report on this phenomenon to try and get a better picture of what's happening globally. We identified 31 states that physically target their nationals in 79 different countries with 160 unique pairings between those origin states and host states. We cataloged over 600 cases of direct physical transnational repression. So things like assault, but that doesn't count all these other problems like spyware. Um, and we kept found those from January, 2014 through November, 2020. Again, these are the only the publicly documented physical attacks. So really, this is just the tip of the iceberg of a much larger problem. In total, we estimate that about 3.5 million people around the world are affected by transnational repression. Globally, many more governments use transnational repression as a strategic tool and do so far more frequently than is typically understood. Um, to give a brief picture of what some of those governments are, some of the most notable campaigns of transnational repression, both for their scope and their aggressiveness, are run by the governments of China, Rwanda, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. So this truly is a global problem with countries of all different sizes engaging in this strategy. The reason we're having this conversation today, however, is to turn the focus to host states or the countries where transnational repression takes place. The 79 host states that I mentioned include many democracies ranging from the US to South Africa to Sweden. So every day, people living in democracies are dealing with the impacts of transnational repression. The role of host states, of democratic governments is incredibly important to understanding why people continue to be vulnerable to transnational repression and finding ways to push back. And that's what our panelists are here to discuss today. So with that, I will turn to our wonderful, wonderful speakers. Um, and I want to start with a big question. Uh, and I'd love to hear from all of our panelists on this. How does transnational repression help authoritarian regimes endure? And on the flip side, how does transnational repression threaten democracies? Yana, I will turn it over to you first. Thanks, Isabel, and thanks for everyone else for joining us today. Um, I think the two questions are actually two sides of the same coin. So I think that transnational rep repression helps uh, authoritarian states endure by silencing the same voices abroad that autocrats try to silence at home. And it's particularly threatening to democracy because the way that autocrats try to silence those voices, the tactics they use, the tactics of transnational repression, including some of the ones that Isabel mentioned like detention or unlawful deportation, actually inject authoritarian practices into democracies. They manipulate and co-opt the institutions and the agencies of democracies in the pursuit of silencing dissidents. I think also much more broadly, transnational repression is a serious threat to democracy because it limits and hinders fundamental rights and freedoms that people enjoy once they live in a democracy. And so even when people escape authoritarian states and relocate to democracies, their freedom of speech, their freedom of assembly, their freedom of association, all those things are limited, hindered, 
um, and snuffed out by transnational repression. And so I think that by injecting authoritarianism into democracies, transnational repression really threatens um, these uh, political systems. Thanks, Jana. Marcus, I'll kick it over to you next. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this great panel. Um, well, to, to add to, to Jana's uh, uh, remarks already, um, I think uh, with the help of transnational repression, uh, authoritarian regimes extend um, domestic political controls into the territory of, of democratic host states. They, they go after uh, critics and opponents in, in diasporas who could either influence domestic audiences in, in, in the authoritarian uh, state or in the, the international environment in ways that oppose uh, the regime's interests of power preservation of, of regime security. And in this way, I think these uh, repressive practices also interfere in, in broader public debates in, in host societies. Um, so they, they mute voices that could be influential for our understanding of um, developments in other countries which have uh, foreign policy implications or security implications. If you think of um, the large scale repression of the Uyghurs by China or developments in, in Turkey, like increasingly autocratic politics in Turkey as a NATO member. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Sienna, would you like to jump in? Yeah, and it's great to be here and thank you to my colleagues for those great points. So just to add to that, I think we've also seen that transnational oppression and the sort of suspicion and fear it engenders leads to big rifts um, in physical and digital communities. Um, to the point where activists and dissidents in exile do all they can to avoid people from the country of origin in their host state. And I think this really challenges people's ability to resettle. It deprives them of an immediate community when they arrive in their host state, which causes a whole host of problems. And it also makes it easier for authoritarian states to continue to spread their repressive policies outside their borders by um, manufacturing and leveraging these divisions. And as Marcus pointed out, this ends up being a very powerful mechanism in um, silencing voices of change. Sorry, a moment of trouble unmuting myself. Nora, to you. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here and uh, to talk along with all of these really. Panelists. Um, I totally agree with all what the other panelists said. Additionally, we all know that conducting transnational digital advo transnational advocacy requires exiled activists to have roots in the country of origin and networks of undercover fellows back home. Therefore, the digital targeting of dissidents in the diaspora is not only a threat targeting them as individuals. It, it targets also the pro-democracy local activists and could expose their networks and put them under serious danger. So the, uh, we believe that the transnational repression um, undermines democracy domestically and transnationally. Thank you. I think you all touched on really the full scope of, of impact from the very kind of personal impacts all the way up to these different levels of, of state impacts. And uh, again, it, how it happens in countries of origin and host states as well. Um, so, you know, I'm also very glad that you, you zeroed in a little bit there on um, the digital component of transnational repression, because that's crucial to understanding what's happening in democracies. People in strong rule of law democracies are generally safer from physical attacks, but we still continue to see these problems and the digital component is a big part of why. So I'd like to turn to Marcus, um, if you can walk us through how these digital attacks work in more detail. And then after that, I'd love to turn it over to Sienna and Nora to talk about the harms that those bring. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I want to emphasize that digital technologies are now an essential component of all forms of, of transnational repression because with the help of digital technologies, state actors can monitor political activity in diaspora communities more easily and with a much greater scope. And then they can also swiftly come up with responses to and threats to any activity that they, they dislike. And activists and journalists, uh, political activists, especially in the diaspora, rely heavily on, on digital platforms. 
in social media and this creates um, uh, multiple points of exposure that, that state agents can then exploit for attacks so um, they can easily collect so-called uh, open source intelligence so information on campaigns uh, interviews of activists their friends and networks travels and conferences and this information then is can be used to prepare further threats and, and attacks and then we also have more aggressive forms of targeted surveillance uh, when regime agents try to gain access to uh, the correspondence or, or the confidential data of activists by hacking into their devices and, and email accounts or social media accounts. Um, in this context, we see increasingly see advanced and very expensive uh, commercial spyware put into use against targets in, in civil society. So yeah, the paradigm example here is the global abuse of the Pegasus spyware uh, by repressive uh, governments across the world. And then other digital threats include online harassment and, and smear campaigns when regimes will try to use false and uh, distorted information, verbal threats and abuse against activists to intimidate them, put them under pressure or taint their, their reputation. And it's important to mention um, that these digital threats are always intertwined with more direct methods of transnational repression. So, for example, when security agents monitor social media and they find out about the campaign or media interview of an activist, they can easily go then uh, after her parents and arrest or pressure her parents. And uh, in the case of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, we have also seen that Saudi Arabia decided to go ahead with the operation against him in Istanbul after it had spied on, on the communication, on his communications with, with other activists, which somehow changed their, their threat perceptions. So regimes can always escalate digital threats into other forms of transnational repression. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. And now, Sienna and Nora, I know you've been doing some really interesting research on what this actually means for people. Could you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, and thanks to Marcus for that great introduction. So um, I'll just say a few words and pass it over to Nora. But broadly speaking, we can group the impacts of digital transnational repression into the following buckets. So we've seen impacts to psychosocial health, particularly mental health um, of activists and dissidents who are targeted in exile. Like I mentioned earlier, the erosion of, of community and transnational networks. Um, Self-censorship self is another very important consequence that we see, as well as, um, as Marcus mentioned at the end, threats to physical security um, that are then an escalation up from digital, um, digital threats. And so seen through the framework of international human rights law, we see that digital transnational oppression really leads to a range of interferences and restrictions um, and impairments of the rights of activists and dissidents living in exile. And this is probably fairly self-evident, but for example, the right to free expression, the right to privacy, and the right to peaceful assembly, which extends to um, online spaces. And I'll hand it over to Nora to talk a bit more about our research on these issues. Yeah, thanks, Diana. Thank you, Marcus. Um, in order to understand these uh, impacts better in the Canadian context, a country which would be considered relatively safe for dissidents and activists and democracy. We conducted interviews with a number of dissidents and activists living in exile in Canada. Uh, those participants have been targeted with different, with a variety of digital means, not only uh, commercial spyware, but also smear campaigns or other uh, digital uh, uh, target attempts. In terms of the uh, of effects on psychological health, we noticed across the uh, board that participants talk about the, uh, the serious psychological impact that digital targeting had on them. For instance, they spoke of being in constant pain, being anxious and paranoid, and being unable to study, sleep, or work properly. Participants also expressed that they, uh, they stopped socializing with people from their country of origin or even uh, avoid them at all uh, costs and stop trusting people online out of fear that family members and colleagues in the country of origin might be punished as marcus said for association with them participants also limited communication with these individuals or even cut them off completely this has made effective uh, 
transnational uh, advocacy work very difficult, as I mentioned previously, for them. Where participants resist, their work is conducted cloud clouded by this ever uh, present of fear that their uh, action will lead to the death or imprisonment of someone they care about or that their own privacy will be seriously compromised. One of the coping mechanisms we noticed for, these, uh, for the threat of transnational digital repression was simply to engage in various levels of self-censorship. One participant, for instance, explained that they would ask friends to untag them on social media posts for something as basic as having lunch together. We also saw that the digital uh, insecurity can lead to physical insecurity. For, in uh, for example, location tracking on a device can facilitate with in-person harassment of uh, dissidents here in Canada. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus, for that summary, and Sienna and Nora for digging a little deeper into impacts. I think it's really important for us to look at this, these digital transnational repression issues, because even though they may not make headlines like assassinations do, there's clearly really important impacts that affect people and therefore affect the democracies in which they live. So now that we have a bit of a clearer picture of what's actually happening in democracies, I want to shift us to look at what governments are doing or can do. Um, but as we've already gotten a very clear understanding, I think transnational repression is an incredibly difficult, personal, and really big problem. So I want to start by asking Yana, could you talk to us about why transnational repression is so challenging for democratic states to address? Certainly. And I think actually Sienna and Nora's description of the harms of digital repression can extend and actually demonstrate um, why all kinds of transnational repression, all the tactics of transnational repression are very difficult to deal with. One is that the harms are extensive and they impact various different policy areas. They impact even people's lives um, in different ways, from the psychological to the social to the political. And we see that for in order for a government to address this, they need to deal with um, several different problems at once. So it often means that you have to address issues in national security, you have to address issues in immigration, in um, technological uh, regulation and in export controls. Um, so it's a lot of different problems all at once. Addressing transnational repression also means that you need coordinated action between different levels um, of actors from sort of the national um, policymakers all the way down to local law enforcement, civil society, people who work in refugee resettlement. Um, and these are actors that rarely speak to each other directly and even more rarely act in kind of coordinated ways. I think Zooming out a little bit, one of the biggest issues for democracies is actually seeing transnational repression as a global phenomenon rather than focusing in on particular states and their particular actions. I think what we see right now is that when um, an incident happens um, that is high profile, we tend to focus in on the state, the adversarial state that is behind that action. And so it becomes a conversation about what do we do about China? What do we do about Iran? What do we do about Rwanda? And instead, what we need to do is think about this as a toolkit of authoritarianism, as a way that authoritarians of all stripes reach across borders to try and silence dissent. And if we think about it that way, then we can move kind of forward um, from silo solutions and piecemeal solutions to a comprehensive way of addressing um, this problem that deals all the way from psychological effects to um, national security concerns. Thanks, Yana. Um, that certainly lays it out well and kind of shifts us to our ne my next question, which is for everyone. And I would love to hear from all of you, uh, what gaps do you see in the international responses to incidents of transnational repression? Sienna, maybe I can turn it over to you first. Yeah, sure. And um, yeah, I'll build a bit off what Yana just said, because I think those were some great points. So one thing to keep in mind right now is that we don't really have a common language or a common framework for discussing this issue across um, different states or really how to respond. Um, so just as an example from the Canadian context, um, being Canada, 
uh, focused in some of our research, we might speak of digital transnational oppression and transnational oppression as falling under um, like general government policies intended to address foreign interference. But then Canadian government activity on foreign interference has really focused primarily on threats to um, Canadian institutions and critical infrastructure and has basically, from what we can tell, totally missed the issue of transnational repression. Um, and so building off what Yana said earlier, I think one response to this is the development of some kind of global instrument um, that articulates a clear human rights centered framework for addressing um, the proliferation and use of cyber surveillance technologies as, as one issue, but also other issues related to digital transnational oppression, which goes broader than just um, the proliferation of cyber surveillance technologies on a global level, and also spelling out what action states um, should be taking domestically. <clears throat> Should I, I can add, add to that, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to yeah, also emphasize on and, and confirm that often these issues are separated from, from other uh, topics of, of yeah, protecting security or guaranteeing security within uh, in the, the host state. So if, you, if we consider the example of, of cyber security, then uh, policies and frameworks for cybersecurity, for instance, in Europe, um, focus very much on threats against critical infrastructure. Uh, they start to consider these, yeah, what we call hybrid influence operations, like in the election interference and, and the like. Um, but they neglect these uh, threats of globalized repression against civil society and, and diasporas. Although, as as we have uh, pointed out. Uh, these uh, threats very much uh, touch upon the yeah, security interests and, and the authority of, of, of the, the host states. And diasporas are seen at times at, as uh, proxies for, for influence operations, uh, that are proxies who are then manipulated by their origin country governments. So this frames them more as a security risk uh, rather than foregrounding threats to their, their own uh, security. And on a practical level, um, I think that uh, for yeah, like targeted programs to strengthen the digital resilience of civil society organizations or of diasporas are almost uh, non-existent because funding uh, will always go then more to the uh, origin countries, but not focus on people who are uh, in the in the host state and considered safe. So this is a yeah practical issue of support. Thank you. Uh, I can jump now. Um, yeah, actually, adding to what others said, I think um, I totally agree with Yana. Uh, I believe that transnational repression and digital transnational repression uh, should be addressed as a global phenomenon. Hence, a global and comprehensive response is needed. The more we have democratic states act individually, the more backdoors would be open to authoritarian regimes and the less free and safe spaces would be remain to the exiled activists. Democratic states are responsible for the safety of people on their territories. And as Marcus just mentioned, there is a common incorrect assumption that once people arrive in democratic states, they are safe. But the reported transnational and digital transnational uh, threats still otherwise. Addressing the issue is, the only, uh, is only the starting point. Further, there are other gaps in laws and policies. Some of them uh, are already highlighted in, uh, uh, in our uh, study of Canada, as Sienna just mentioned. Um, but uh, also, uh, if I can summarize everything together, we need a global framework that prevent, prohibit, protect, and absolutely hold uh, all people involved, all uh, perpetrators accountable, whether they are uh, tech companies, private sector, individuals, or even authoritarian regimes. Without justice, we cannot protect anyone. We should stop and protect the, uh, the, the potential victims of the future. Thank you. I think I'll just jump in here to, um, to double down on what Nara said, and also emphasize the fact that Many of our international responses, foreign policy responses right now are ad hoc and they're only really calibrated or um, deployed in really high profile cases. Um, you know, when uh, Sergei Skripal is poisoned or when 
uh, Raman Ratsevich is pulled off a plane by Belarus or when Jamal Khashoggi is murdered. These are the kinds of cases that attract targeted coordinated sanctions. But I think what um, the work of all the panelists and the, and the work of Freedom House has shown is that transnational repression is actually very, very common. Not only is it global, it happens a lot. We've documented hundreds of incidents. There have been more than 40 just this year, 2021. And the vast majority uh, provoke no response whatsoever from state authorities and from democracies in which these people are living for the most part. Um, and so, you know, we need to start thinking about this as a global phenomenon. We need to start thinking about it as an everyday phenomenon. Um, and until we do that, I think some of these gaps that we're talking about will remain. Thank you all. You've uh, again set me up very well for my next question. Um, but first, I just want to flag for our audience that this is my last question. So if you do have uh, questions that you'd like to submit, please add them to the Q&A now to make sure that we can get to them. Um, but to end our discussion on kind of a more positive note, having noted all of these gaps, um, could you share what's already being done to combat transnational oppression? I don't want to say it's not all doom and gloom. There's a big problem, but we are seeing some positive things. So I'd love to hear about examples of innovative approaches that you'd like to highlight or practices that you want to see more of. Um, feel free, whoever wants to start us off. Maybe I can start here. Um, I think the awareness of transnational repression is growing. Um, I think the fact that we are having this webinar as part of the side events for the Democracy Summit um, is a positive sign. I think I have heard uh, transnational repression be referred to as a problem, as a threat to human rights by the US government, by the German government, um, by other governments. And even when it's not spoken of specifically as transnational repression, the idea that um, human rights activists abroad are still at risk of being targeted by authoritarian states is something that I think is on the radar um, now in a way that it may not have been in the past. Um, I think going back to some of what we were talking about before, what we really need to do is to shift our thinking. For a long time, I think, democracy promotion and um, the protection of human, right, uh, human rights defenders has really focused on either helping those countries do or helping those people do what they do in their home country or evacuating them when the situation becomes dangerous for them. What we need to think about now is if, if authoritarianism has gone global, how can we make human rights promotion go global as well? How can we extend protections to people and overcome this idea that Nora and others have mentioned that you are safe just because now you're in a democracy. We need to overcome that and we need to rethink the ways that we are um, helping human rights defenders and activists carry on their work, continue their work once they've left their country. And part of that goes back to what Marcus and Sienna mentioned. We need to rethink national security interests. We need to think about what we're protecting, what we mean when we say a national security priority is the promotion of democracy and defending people's rights a national security priority for us? And in some cases, you know, there are countries, um, Sweden among them, who have, uh, to a degree, taken that into account. Um, and I think we need to be moving in that direction. Yeah, I can add uh, to that, yeah. Um, Again, like with a little more focus on the uh, EU and, and, and what yeah, European countries, I think yeah, um, awareness is only uh, gradually increasing and, and uh, there's yeah, certainly attention uh, when there are high profile cases or, uh, or um, in relation to uh, the repression of the Uyghurs because of the scale of, of this uh, campaign um, or if, if it concerns a prominent uh, diaspora group, like for instance, uh, the Turkish diaspora in, in, in Germany, in a, in a host country. Um, but at the same time, I think these issues are still uh, separated from other foreign policy streams and, and topics. So uh, transnational repression is never uh, jointly discussed with economic cooperation or, or uh, 
um, yeah, other foreign policy topics. And I, yeah, the most important initiatives, so, so to emphasize the good things, I think the most important initiatives to combat transnational repression come from civil society and, and from investigative research, uh, from journalism. Um, so the topic needs to figure more prominently on, on government agenda, agendas, but we also need to see more support for um, expanding these bottom-up initiatives. Yeah? And, and in the context, for instance, of, of digital uh, transnational repression, um, this means that uh, civil society should also be able to draw on resources from the private sector, as we have now seen uh, in the example of Apple um, pledging support for the Citizen Lab and, and for other uh, organizations working on, on digital security or civil society. Yeah, that's a point, yeah. Yeah, I can just make a quick point to add to that. I think one big question is how to facilitate um, accountability for acts of transnational repression, uh, digital or otherwise. And I think that's still a big gap that needs to be explored. Um, and one element of that I think is better understanding how domestic legal systems can be used to further accountability. And there's some challenges there, for example, with foreign state immunity. Um, so I think directing our attention to that is one part of it. And I think one thing I'm really curious about and I haven't heard much about um, is how activists and dissidents in exile who are being impacted by transnational oppression see accountability. Like what kind of remedies are they hoping for? I think it would be great to have those voices come to the forefront of the discussion because it's easy to talk about litigation, but litigation is expensive and complicated and long and you face numerous hurdles, stressful. Maybe that's not sort of the, the main framework that we should be thinking through issues. Um, yeah, uh, over to Nora, I think she had a comment to add to this. Yeah, just uh, there is a quote from one of our interviews came to my, uh, to my mind now, when one of our research participants said, states have more resources, unfortunately. Um, I believe that more button up uh, initiatives that would be state sponsored or even uh, global civil society sponsored. For example, in our study in Canada, uh, has shown that organizations that provide support for uh, to refugees when they arrive in Canada need more resources to understand how to engage with digital transnational repression and how to protect their clients. This is well said. They want to take action on this, but. Uh, they are, uh, but are faced with limited of resources and skills and knowledge sometimes. So training these organizations to understand the types of digital danger and pressure their clients might be under, under and how to respond and provide the uh, resources to do so. It's not necessary to be a complicated intervention and yet it could um, help to, uh, to have like a huge impact on the uh, targeted communities here. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, we are starting to get some questions in, so I will share those and please feel free to, to jump in as you um, want to answer them. I'll start here. There's a question. Um, in terms of responses to transnational repression, what are your thoughts on the usefulness of creation of a UN Special Rapporteur on Transnational Repression or some other entity with the ability to transcend national boundaries and coordinate responses? Whoever would like to take that one, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, that would be uh, extremely useful. And I think it has also been mentioned in, in your Freedom House uh, report that um, uh, often now acts of transnational re repression escape uh, established means of human rights uh, reporting because they are somehow, uh, yeah, fall in, in, into a gap on, on uh, human rights, reporting on human rights violations in, in the countries of origin or in, in authoritarian contexts. And uh, uh, yeah, specific uh, violations of, of human rights, like we have uh, the special rapporteur for violations of freedom of expression, uh, but you don't have a compre comprehensive, uh, systematic account of, of uh, practices of acts of transnational repression. So it would be useful yeah, to draw attention to these acts and, and highlight uh, more uh, what is going on. Yeah, just to, um, 
Oh, sorry, sorry. go ahead. So go ahead. <laughs> Just to add to that, I think one of my points earlier was that there's a lack of a common language. So um, a special rapporteur, for example, on, on the international stage would be super helpful in terms of, I think, better developing that common language uh, as well. I think it would be interesting as a possibility of bringing um, specific complaints up to the UN to the UN level, and that would be one mechanism potentially to do that. So I think that's a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think, you know, so some of these cases are dealt with, or at least we see them covered by various working groups, you know, the working group on arbitrary detention, um, on disappearances, I think um, more action in that regard is, is certainly positive. One obstacle is that the working groups really deal with one, one case at a time and they deal with a limited number of cases. And so um, there's a bottleneck there. And as I said before, you know, there are hundreds of incidents of transnational repression. So I think the advantage of having a rapporteur would be to, again, make clear that this is a global everyday phenomenon um, that goes far beyond some of the more notable cases that I think most people are aware of. Thanks for that. Um, so that's kind of very high level recommendation. I want to bring us back down to kind of the, the, the root of the problem here. We have a question on about what civil society can do. So what can civil society do in their respective countries? Um, what are some basic policy recommendations that they can make to their governments? Maybe I can kick us off a little bit here. Um, I think I think um, some of the panelists have already discussed some simple things that civil society can do. I think also we need to think broadly about which parts of civil society are um, potentially in contact with people who are targeted by transnational repression. So it's not only um, sort of political exiles or the civil society groups that support political exiles or say, um, you know, work on digital transnational repression or um, digital hygiene and things like that. It's also civil society that aid in the resettlement of newcomers and refugees to countries that need to be aware of the problem of transnational repression. The fact that um, people are targeted certainly because of their political activism or journalism, but sometimes whole diasporas, you know, as Isabel um, outlined in her opening remarks, whole diasporas can also be targeted. And sometimes it's just being a member of the group that makes you a target of transnational repression. And so the intervention that can happen for those people is with the civil society um, groups that help them um, you know, come to a new country and settle there. And so I think just more you know, awareness, more information for those groups and channels for those groups to connect potentially people who are targeted to law enforcement and to um, you know, make it clear that you can report that this is happening um, and that someone in your government in your new um, home country uh, cares to hear that this is happening to you. Yeah, I can just jump in quickly. I think one of the things we noticed in the Canadian context was a lack of um, like an outlet to which people could report these acts happening to them. That was a very complicated way of saying like someone in government who understands what's going on and is able to respond in some way. I think um, people that we interviewed um, that tried to approach the Canadian government in certain circumstances, whether it was like law enforcement or intelligence or something else, and received pretty apathetic responses is maybe a, a generous way of putting it. Um, and I think so that like in terms of policy recommendations, that could be something like a national institution that coordinates across government to um, deal with situations of transnational repression, like map the issue, understand what's happening, and sort of roll out defenses to communities who are being impacted. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's that's one, one potential issue to raise. Yeah, maybe just to add to two short points. Uh, one thing is still uh, documenting. I mean, this is the classic role of civil society, you know, documenting these incidents and, and uh, raising awareness on it. And, and the other point would be, yeah, adding to what, what uh, Sienna and, and Jana said, um, maybe yeah, some kind of training or seminars for law enforcement agencies uh, to, to uh, make them more aware of, of what is going on and, and uh, sensible to, towards these cases. That would be also an option for civil society organizations in, in the host country. 
There's a question here about the broader diaspora um, and what their role is in transnational oppression. For example, can immigrants who are loyal to authoritarian regimes engage in transnational oppression through controlling and repressing dissident immigrants abroad? So I'd love to hear your take on that. And also, how can democratic governments deal with that when there are sometimes non-state actors or actors who are kind of what their affiliation is, is might be unknown. How can democratic governments approach that problem? I can jump on that. Um, yeah, definitely through the um, also, uh, reported cases besides the interviews we conducted in Canada, uh, many of the uh, transnational oppression, whether physical harassment or verbal harassment, besides the digital transnational oppression, are conducted by individuals who are might be in somehow state backed or uh, just loyal to the government. So uh, I, I think, first of all, building on the uh, uh, recommendations already, uh, the other colleagues uh, mentioned that civil society should uh, play a like, crucial role in reporting these incidents to the government. And as I uh, just uh, said in the recommendations, um, accountability should be expanded to hold the individuals accountable as also. Uh, I think, yeah, during the Arab Spring um, 2011 and 2012, uh, the FBI and other countries were uh, like responding so much to the uh, harassment by individuals on their territories targeting the pro-democracy protesters and the diaspora community and so on. So we need to keep it going. We need to keep the channels open and uh, uh, absolutely, there's a lot, as long as we don't have like framework or institutional and legal framework in state, um, like official one, uh, the, that makes things harder for civil society, but we really need to keep reporting this and they need to push the government to hold these uh, individuals or non-state actors accountable. I think I'll just add that um, I think governments and states so certainly yes i think there is there are um issues within diasporas there are members of diasporas who um who take part in or facilitate transnational repression and i think one thing that complicates that is when governments when democracies tap into diasporas um, for resources in terms of helping people either settle or in the immigration process. So what we've seen in some of our research in Europe is that um, when countries lack uh, language resources where they don't have independent interpreters, let's say, they will recruit people from the diaspora who already live in the country to act as translators in asylum cases. And there have been reports of those um, translators and interpreters actually intimidating people or informing on people um, while there are asylum cases ongoing on behalf of the government. So we've seen this in, with um, members of the Eritrean diaspora and some European states. And so governments need to be aware of that. I think, you know, going back to what Marcus was saying about information sharing and information collection, um, you know, democratic governments need to be aware of these dynamics as they're happening, and they need to take measures not to contribute to them in unintentional ways by, um, you know, just sort of taking the path of least resistance and recruiting unvetted interpreters, let's say, in their immigration process. So there are things like that that I think um, governments should be aware of uh, and, you know, can, can be addressed with more resources. Thanks. Um, I have a couple questions that I'm going to combine here. There, are, you know, we've kind of talked about authoritarian uh, origin states and democratic host states, but there are a couple of questions here about the gray area of what happens um, when states are co-opted, and that's kind of the role they play in transnational repression. So there's a question: um, How can we combat transnational repression when state actors are co-opted, uh, even if citizens are victimized? What recourse is there for people who are not high-profile or public officials? And also along those lines, there's a question about states that enable and facilitate transnational repression through the development of weaponized uh, surveillance tools, including democracies. Um, so any thoughts on kind of how democratic governments, civil society um, can help approach these states that are kind of riding the line of what their role is in transnational repression? Uh, 
I can jump on the second part of that question in terms of the prolifer proliferation of cyber surveillance technologies. I wanted to mention it earlier, but I thought I might be getting in the weeds. Um, but no, I think that's a really good point. I mean, um, the United States, Canada, the European Union, like are all participating in this um, like infrastructure around digital transnational oppression, I think in some way. And, and that's in particular through the market for um, cyber surveillance technologies. And I think we're seeing some progress in curbing that. Um, the EU has recently um, amended some of its regulations around dual use exports with the particular intent um, to try and limit the export of this stuff from the EU to countries that are then going to turn around and use it against um, activists and dissidents in exile or against uh, um, public officials within the European Union, as we've been seeing in the last wave of disclosures. Um, so I think export rules is one mechanism, but I think what we need, export rules are, are like patchy and piecemeal at best. I think what we need is coming back to sort of global frameworks as a global framework that addresses the import export and use of cyber surveillance technologies and really sets like a, a global framework for how at least democratic states are going to be using this, which hopefully might um, move the needle in the right direction in terms of um, curbing uh, proliferation. Yeah, maybe uh, one point is that yeah, democratic host states should have more um, let's say awareness on on how entangled uh, these these issues are. Um, so so if you um, in the case of the EU externalize your borders to to Turkey uh, in the interest of keeping uh, migrants out, uh, you will trap a lot of people who would yeah rightfully claim political asylum in in European countries. You you trap them. Uh, in a host country, in a third country, where they can be easily reached uh, by by their uh, home state. So, if you consider like Iranian activists who are trapped in, in Turkey, um, they can easily be reached or uh, detained then by Turkish authorities and and, and rendered back to 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 Iran. And or the other uh, point if, that if you equip people, uh, states, governments along these uh, migration routes with surveillance technology or, or, or train them uh, to monitor uh, my, migration um, flows, uh, then they will use these uh, capacities also uh, against civil society and within their borders and maybe beyond uh, borders. So there needs to be more awareness on how interlinked and, 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 and yeah, entangled these, these issues are. And just to add to what Marcus is saying, I think democracies, how can we, how can we influence the behavior of other states? So say these gray zone states. Well, one way that democracies can do that is by using their voice and their vote in international organizations at the UN in organizations like Interpol. Interpol abuse is one of the, well, uh, leading tactics of transnational repression, being able to issue a red notice or a diffusion against a critic or dissident living abroad means that you um, make it easier to detain them, possibly to deport them, you, you uh, restrict their ability to travel, uh, you know, you put them at risk. And Interpol is a members membership organization where democracies have a say. And so democracies should exercise uh, their membership powers in order to um, promote reform, to promote reform in these, in these um, organizations that, um, you know, facilitate acts of transnational repression and to promote accountability. You know, if you abuse uh, Interpol, there should be a consequence for that. And I think that's one way that, that democracies can have an effect on um, other states and what they do, essentially. Since we seem to be moving across the democratic spectrum here, uh, we do have a question about um, what can be done to protect people who are targeted in authoritarian host states. Um, so if what, what can democracies do about this? What can civil society, you name it? Uh, this is a really tricky question, but um, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on it. Oh, I can add a few thoughts, maybe. 
Um, first of all, I think uh, the action should be taken on two levels. First of all, the level of the, uh, the immigrant communities themselves and authoritarian states, um, how they should think about the risk uh, to stay protected and to stay also uh, connected to the international uh, organizations to report any incidents. Um, I know there's a lot of tragic incidents of uh, whether imprisonment or uh, deportation, um, but unfortunately, many of them are not reported. So reporting and talking about the risk is something uh, must be like talk seriously, must be talking seriously among the uh, immigration immigrant communities in the uh, authoritarian states. Uh, besides that, absolutely, as we keep talking about the uh, global framework, once we have a global framework and all democratic states are involved and are on board in it, that would make things easier uh, to keep uh, all of these authoritarian states under pressure and hold them accountable through the international uh, mechanisms. I think something else that can be helpful um, is just drawing attention to these cases. I think as Nora was saying, you know, a lot of cases, um, we don't hear about them uh, either because they don't attract attention or because they're not reported. And so one thing that can happen even in democratic states is that, or in, I'm sorry, in non-democratic states is that, you know, democracies have a presence even in non-democratic states. They have embassies, they have diplomatic staff, and it's important for that staff to be aware of that this problem can happen and to make timely interventions. What we've seen is that sometimes um, timely intervention by foreign states, uh, especially when the non-democratic state has a relationship with the democratic state, really makes a difference in individual cases. And that's a, I mean, that's a heavy burden to put on diplomatic staff in countries, but I do think that is one point of leverage that democracies have and um, should use more often. So we are coming close to time. So I wanna ask just one last question. Um, there's an audience question, is the Freedom House report out of sight, not out of reach, a one-off or will the study become an annual publication? So I'll start, with, I'll start with Yana for that one, but I also wanna use this as a chance for all of our panelists to flag upcoming issues, work, last final thoughts that they want people who are listening today to take away with them and remember um, as we head into the Summit for Democracy. So Yana, if you want to start off with that narrow question and then the rest of the panelists, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, um, that's a good question. Almost like it's planted. Um, yes, we are actually working on a follow-up to the report that was put out in February. That report really was about identifying transnational repression as a global phenomenon. And we um, you know, cataloged cases, we pointed out trends, we identified origin states, host states, uh, the whole array of tactics of transnational repression. What our um, sort of phase two of the work is, is turning our attention to host states. So how can democratic states and even non-democratic states better respond to protect people who are living inside their borders who may be targeted by transnational repression? And so we are doing a series of case studies that will look at policy um, proposals. And we are also doing another global report, which will then broaden out and look at things like what can international organizations do? What can universities do where lots of international students may be targeted, um, as well as uh, some, um, some work on digital uh, transnational repression and what can online platforms do to contribute to um, helping with that problem. So that is our work going forward uh, and look for our next report um, sometime at the end of May. Um, and I know that all the panelists also have ongoing work on this topic. So I'm excited to hear about what else is happening. I can jump in quickly. We'll be releasing a report um, around March, um, summarizing some of what's been discussed here in the Canadian context with a specific focus on the impact of digital transnational oppression on communities in Canada. Um, and from a personal level, one thing I'm really interested in exploring going forward, and I think is still kind of missing from the how to respond discussion, and Yana touched on it at the very end, is um, how social media companies um, deal with this kind of activity and 
Um, yeah, I think it would be interesting in the context of, of that type of research to understand um, how targeted in individuals, um, who individuals who are being targeted with, with practices of digital transnational oppression have attempted to resolve these um, cases by reaching out to, for example, social media companies and whether that's had any traction, whether there have been um, changes like community standards and guidelines and how, yeah, in general, how companies have responded. I think that's a big part of it because I think um, action from states will be slow um, as it generally is, but companies in the private sector um, may be in the position to respond a bit more quickly um, to these kind of situations. So I think that'll be interesting to explore going forward. Okay, and I thought Nora might want to go first, but uh, um, yeah, I think uh, the whole uh, field of, of research and, and uh, yeah, um, reporting is moving towards uh, uh, host country responses, implications, uh, and, and uh, my own work certainly also will, will go uh, in that direction. I think what is important is that uh, yeah, still uh, to raise awareness and to keep in mind that these threats not only uh, like only in, in target foreigners or, or on our territories, uh, but yeah, that they have implications for for the entire uh, society because yeah, these people come to democratic host societies for their openness, uh, for uh, the rule of law, and and again they they uh, experience similar threats to the ones they, they have fled in, in the first place. So I think this is important to, to highlight and, and to, to uh, shed light on, on these uh, dynamics. And as a possible uh, research focus, because Sienna mentioned uh, one, um, I will add also uh, yeah, the role of the private, of, of enablers of, of uh, uh, transnational repression in, in host countries. So we, we know a lot, there's a lot of attention on, on the surveillance uh, sector, but there are also other uh, enablers like private detectives, um, public relations companies, uh, uh, a lot of yeah smaller uh, helpers uh, that, that play a, a decisive role in these practices. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just in summary, we have, uh, you know, the Citizen Lab uh, frequently uh, release reports, technical reports about the uh, digital threats. So some of these cases, uh, we focus a lot on the commercial spyware in these uh, in this program. So some of these cases are about uh, exiled dissidents, other about the uh, dissidents who are acting domestically. So we don't know what's uh, coming next. <laughs> Thank you. But really looking forward to read all of your publication. It would be a great learning opportunity. Thanks so much. Well, that brings us to time. Um, couldn't have planned that better. Thank you all for keeping your comments uh, timely there. This has been a great conversation. I mean, I'm so glad that we can have this ahead of the summit. Hopefully, um, some of these recommendations can be carried forward and we've sparked some new awareness today. Um, so thank you all for joining. Thanks to the audience for listening in. And um, again, thank you, International Idea, for um, organizing the forum. This has been a great opportunity. Uh, Marcus, did I see you uh, jump in there? No? Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we will close out and hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.